Welcome everybody to the one year podcast versary, if that's even a word. Military Veterans Podcast has just turned one uh, in this month of October and the year of 2021. So thank you to everybody that's been involved from the guests that have been on to the friends and family that have shared on behalf of them and to anybody else that has listened and learnt and thought it was great to do so. Now, please, just to help celebrate this milestone, it would be amazing if you could jump onto Apple Podcast and give this a review with a five-star rating. would be amazing. So, yeah, please do that. That would really help the show uh, gain traction a little bit more and uh, get others to hear these stories and experiences. So, great year, what we've just done. Uh, we had 16 amazing episodes, and we start the second year with episode 17, Enjoy this, and I'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye. Welcome to episode 17 of Military Veterans Podcast, where we talk to veterans to learn about their stories and experiences. And today, we're joined by Rachel Williamson. Hey, Rach. Hi. How you doing? I'm good. I'm good. How are you? I'm doing all right, thank you. Uh, it took me a little while to set all the equipment up, but you, you were quite impressed with the setup, weren't you? I like to give you a challenge. You know, it's, <laughs> I like it. Yeah, it's a yeah, different atmosphere, but I like it. Yeah. I think you said earlier this would be what uh, your room would look like if the walls were painted black. <laughs> yeah, I don't think I'm going to do it, but uh, no, I like it. I like all the layout and equipment. Impressive. Thank you. Thank you. And um, well, thank you for inviting me uh, and to being uh, a guest on the show. We've never crossed paths before, have we? So no, no. This is actually the first time we're meeting in person and, and it's been really cool to connect with you. Um, and the other few exciting things about this episode is... This is marking the one year anniversary of the podcast. Yay! How cool Congratulations. Is that? Thank you so much. We should have champagne and cake. We should, but we don't want to mess up the rug. We've got no. my military veterans podcast rug. If you're watching it on YouTube, you can see it. So uh, good work. Yeah. But yeah, we will have the cake later, no doubt. Of course, of course. <laughs> um, and then the other exciting thing is uh, do, do I say it now? No, I'm going to say it in a bit after we've done the four questions. Okay. All right. And then I'll, I'll share what I'm thinking. It'll make more sense in a bit. Okay. So we'll do the four questions, um, get your answers, and then we'll dive into the, the deep part of, of your career. Sound good? Good. Fantastic. So the questions are, when did you join? What service and branch did you join? How long did you serve for? And what rank did you get to? So I joined in 2007 in the Royal Air Force, originally as a PTI, a physical training instructor, and then I retraded to a medic. I got to the rank of SAC and served 10 and a half years. Nice, nice. So SAC, for anybody that's uh, not aware of that rank? It is Senior Aircraftman slash Woman. Okay. <laughs> and, and what's that kind of equivalent to, let's say, to the Army? Like a lance jack. Like a lance jack. Yeah, lance one corporal. before corporal. Brilliant stuff, brilliant stuff. Well, the thing I was just getting excited about is you are the first RAF, Royal Air Force person on the show. Yay, doing it for the service. So you are, you're, you're, you're flying that flag. For, <laughs> more, for, cake. <laughs> more cake. More <laughs> cake. Uh, that's a really, really, really cool start to the show. Um, so let's get into to yourself. This is your episode. Uh, and let's start at the very beginning. So where was you born and where did you grow up? I was born in Chesterfield in Derbyshire and wasn't there for long. And then we moved to Lincolnshire, Spalding, and lived there pretty much most of my childhood. Okay, okay. And what was the childhood like? Was it uh, an enjoyable one? It was a bit chaotic. Chaotic? Yeah. I Because I was born uh, premature, I had to get into sports early to sort of learn how to build on coordination and breathing. And so I was introduced to swimming. Okay. And okay. that pretty much was my entire childhood was swimming. I didn't really get into sort of academic side of school. It was just um, me and a pool and then having fun. I was just a high practice sporty kid. Right. So you enjoyed the swimming aspect? Yeah, yeah. It was um, at the time, I think I just wanted to mess about and splash and 
pretend to look like you were drowning sometimes just to see if the lifeguards were awake. <laughs> and yeah, I think at the time it was just, um, my mum wanted to make sure that I sort of was building in myself and I was stronger. And if we ever went on holiday, I wouldn't drown in the sea. Okay. I think that was the main, you know, she wanted all her children to learn how to swim as well. Nice. So what, can you remember what age you started that? About seven. About seven. About six, seven, yeah. And did that grow into something big? Yeah, it was um, my swimming coach at the time told me, you know, I'm going like this in the baby pool, doing little whips all the time. And they were like, oh, she's actually got, she's picking this up really well. Do you want to put her into like the next sort of class going up? And that was when I started sort of swimming in the main 25 metre cable parts. And um, yeah, just enjoyed it from there and ended up joining my actual local swimming club and just training for fun, really. So, yeah. And what's that training like? Because I've swam myself. Uh, I wouldn't say I was any good. Uh, <laughs> I may, maybe I could blame the teachers. I'm not too sure. Okay. Um, yeah. But I always see the classes that go on and they do so many lengths. And I'm like, I'm struggling here with yeah. 10. <laughs> That's the downside about swimming. You have to do a lot of work for little improvement. Like it takes a lot of time and sort of, but I was at the age where it was just fun and I made friends and some of those went to my school. And I think when I started, the lessons were probably about 45 minutes. And it really isn't much by the time you actually set up, warm up, do a little session, sprinting, playing with like inflatables or whatever, if you were good. And, um, and yeah, it was a good start. You know, it's all about fun and just making new friends. Okay. And did you continue with that or was there kind of like an end goal to it? I think when I started, there wasn't ever a goal. I just enjoyed it. I just met up with people every day. But as the years went by, it started to become a bit more serious. I was eventually put into like higher and higher sort of groups within the actual club and eventually making like the main top team, the main squad and uh, starting doing competitions at weekends. Okay. And I just picked it up really easy. I think because I had to learn to do that coordination and breathing because of health side of things, it sort of made me more, I don't know, pick it up a bit easier maybe over time because I had that head start when I was younger. But um, but my brother and sister, they never really got into sport. So this was like a new one for my parents. We were okay. like, what is a club and what do they do? Yeah. Where for me, I got free tops and I quite like free stash and <laughs> like anyone and you were part of this amazing club with all these new friends and this new sport that I enjoyed and so yeah I ended up doing it multiple times a day for quite a few hours and it really got serious probably when I was I reckon about 13 I reached the nationals and that and that's the first sort of year you can actually reach it as that's like the youngest age you can actually reach the nationals and that's literally saying that you're in the top so many in the country wow compete up against everybody else and I just thought well it's just a day out I get to go in a hotel you know <laughs> let's have fun I never really thought anything of it but um but yeah and it sort of just grew from there and that's when I realized could I be an Olympian okay you know, I always had that, oh, it'd be, ama it'd be amazing if I could. You know, I see all these guys on TV and there were older swimmers at the club at the time who were part of um, Team GB. And my coach eventually was a, one of the GB coaches. And that was sort of my lifestyle. That's how it sort of picked up from there. So does someone say that to you, uh, that may be a future goal? Have you thought yeah, about this? Yeah, my, um, the coach spoke to my mum and basically said, you know, if she put in the effort, this is what's possible. You know, she's got this sort of winning sort of, I don't know, personality and this sort of strong mindset to actually push it to the big leagues if I wanted it. And I think at the time I was just a annoying teenager, hated anything that involved effort. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, you know, moaned and I started doing morning swimmings as well at that time. And... With that current club, I was only swimming with them till I was probably about 15, 16. And then I actually moved club to Northampton because my coach, who was a GB coach, was told, you need to go to a bigger club. 
to okay. sort of broaden your coaching ability. And so me and another swimmer joined him and we swam for Northampton oh, after nice. sporting. So yeah. Oh, nice. So is that alongside education? Yeah. So yeah. I was still, I was at um, secondary school at the time in a lovely all female secondary school. That right. Was okay. <laughs> <laughs> and um, yeah, when it sort of got into the serious side, my actual daily routine was ridiculous looking back on it now. I would, um, my mum would wake me up at half past three in the morning. We would, she would drive me an hour and a half to Northampton to then do a two and a half hour session in the morning, then drive back an hour and a half, get to school, potentially late because of traffic, yeah. and do a whole day of school. And then at that time, I had permission to leave an hour early to beat the traffic. And whatever lesson I missed for the last of each day, I would catch up eventually through lunchtime or in the car some right. way or another. And, uh, yeah, drive back an hour and a half at, like, 3, 4 p.m., do another two and a half hours, then drive back an hour and a half. And I would be home by, like, 10, and then back up at half three the next day. And I think at the time I was probably doing um, morning and evening on a Monday, same on a Tuesday. Wednesday I would have off, which is the best day that I liked because it just <laughs> meant I could actually see my family. Yeah. And then... Again on Thursday morning and after school, Friday the same, and then Saturday morning, and I would get the Sunday off. And I did that for about a good few years, four or five years. And yeah, looking back, I don't know how I did it. I don't know how my parents did it, because I obviously hated being a morning person. It was just a lot of travelling. I have got uh, my dad and brother and sister I would never see, probably... Wednesdays and Sundays was when I actually saw my family. Yeah. And that was my entire secondary school life. That's sort of how it always went. But the bonus of all of that, all the effort that went in, I reached the nationals multiple times. Okay. And eventually the highest I got to was the final of the Commonwealth Trials wow. in 2005 with an aim of getting to the 2006 Commonwealth Trials and then the 2008 Beijing Olympics. Okay. And I was reaching the finals and I thought, this is it. If I get in those top two places, I could actually make the Team GB because they don't like accept everyone that's a finalist. And then um, go from there, you know, try and work my way up to this Olympic dream. But that one, I was basically in two races for that final and it all went perfectly to plan. I think I was winning after the first length and I thought, oh, this is great. I can still see it. But when I touched, I was like fifth. And I was like, how? I was so far in front. But it's just one of those. Everyone swims races in different ways, different tactics. That when we all touched, it could be a hundredth of a second. And that could be you on a team or off a team. And that was it. I decided to give up. Not going to bother anymore. Because Olympics are only every four years. I was already 17 at the time. Okay. And to actually keep that pace up at that age at the top of my field for another few years would be difficult. It would be a lot of um, lifestyle changes because at the time I was GCSE time, so coming to the end of school. Yeah. So I had to make that decision whether I wanted to actually commit and be like a master swimmer or think of a career. Yeah, yeah. And that was, yeah, where I got to. Sounds like, yeah, like a lot of effort and a lot of time to, yeah. to do that. And and was that swimming freestyle? Is, is that Everything. Everything? <laughs> wow. I was one of those annoying kids that did just all the strokes. Fly, butterfly was probably one of my main, hence my shoulders. Okay. And yeah, butterfly and freestyle. But I did like um, individual medleys, which is like a length of each stroke. Okay, yeah. And sort of middle distance, so 200s, 400s which were sort of my main events. So I wanted to be a sprinter because they just did one length and that was them done for the day. <laughs> but I'm not tall enough or have, you know, six foot long arms to reach the end. Right. So, um, yeah, that's sort of how it, my swimming career started and stopped. And okay. I thought, let's not do that anymore. Sounds like you learned a lot from it though. Um, a lot of effort, but you learned a lot yeah. whilst doing it. I sort of, I sort of didn't realise at the time like I remember having a go at my parents all the time, just saying, um, you know, that yes, I really do want to do this sport. I will put the effort in. But if I had a bad day at school or 
if I had a bad morning session, it would affect everything that everyone did for the rest of the day. My mum would be like, oh, I've just driven three hours a day. You've just done five hours and you've got nothing out of it. That's a day wasted, all that fuel. And I thought, oh, but I really do want to do it. But yeah, it just takes time. You just have to be patient. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. And then what does it look like after that? So you, you've decided to hang up your, let's call it Olympic dream. Yeah. Um, what, what, what are the next steps after that look like? So at the time I finished secondary school and it never really occurred to me to sort of think, what do I want to do as a job? Or where do I go after? Do I go to uni or do A-levels or college? And at the time, my sister just finished college and she was joining the Royal Navy. Okay. And we're not from a military family at all. My parents weren't military or anything. So she was the first to yeah, look she was. into it? bit of a shock to my parents I think at the time <laughs> and um, and I just thought it was like a glorified P&O ferry you know I thought oh you know get me some duty free and yeah I saw what she did and I thought I'm gonna join college and I did public services which I think now it's called pre-uniformed services so it's basically learning about the emergency services the armed forces just a complete mixture and I thought well that gives me two years and then I could still decide what I want to do. But I just had no idea. I only ever had, I want to be a swimmer. But it just never occurred to me that if that doesn't happen, what do you do? Yeah, yeah. And so, yeah, I joined college. I did uh, public services, which I enjoyed. And what do you do in that? Um, what do you learn when you're there? It's, it's basically a mixture. So you would have lessons about the prison service, lessons about the armed forces. Um, I remember... We, one of our lecturers was actually a policeman and typical, his name was Bob. So <laughs> Bobby to Bob. And, um, and yeah, and he would tell us about the, uh, the police service and all of that. And I thought, oh, well, that all sounds great. You know, maybe I'll look into one of those. And I remember thinking I could do prison service. You know, I've got the shoulders of a swimmer. Maybe they'd be scared of me. And, and we had to also be a... It was an army cadet was part of it. So you had no choice. You sort of had to be a cadet right. during it where I had no experience of cadet world. I just thought it was all right. <laughs> you know, I just never really saw it as something to go for. But obviously part of this course, you had to have one day in um, army greens and pretend to be in the military and learn a few skills. And I just remember I thought, oh, I'm sure we have day trips out. That's all I ever wanted was to travel places. And um, and I was still sporty. I still, um, I mean, even though I sort of quit swimming, I did the odd football session. And typically I was the only female in my class. So we used to do a lot of um, prison rules football where you just do whatever you want as long as you've got the ball, you know. Right. And I just probably use that to my advantage to just jump on them <laughs> and just say, you know, ball's mine. But... Yeah, and then it sort of, it was probably the last year I thought, oh, maybe I'll look into the military because my sister was in the Navy and I thought maybe I'll just join her. But at the time when I was looking at trades, I heard about the physical training instructor and the PTI thinking I'm pretty sporty. I'm fit, but I'm not like mega, mega fit. But I thought, you know, they teach you, you can learn it. And yeah. I decided it was then I was going to join the Royal Air Force only because of the PTI trade. Okay. Because you can join straight up as one, where the Navy and the Army have to be in another trade first, and the PTI is your second role. Got it. And so that was the only reason why I joined the RAF in the end. So I thought, I want to be a PTI. And you'd never <laughs> seen or heard really much of the Air Force before? Nothing at all. <laughs> wow. I think in the back of my mind, I just thought, I'm sure my mum probably told me, saying, worst case, you just come out. You know, if you don't like it, you just come home. And I thought, actually, that's quite a good sort of logic to have. Whatever you do in life, it doesn't matter if you don't enjoy it. You can just stop what you're doing, have a break and find something else. That's fair, that's fair. And that was, yeah, I just thought, I'll just do that then. Go with the flow. So you signed up and you headed off for 
is it basic training in the Air Force? Now, bearing in mind, I've <laughs> never had an RAF person on here before. Unfortunately, so. the hotels were full. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, so I joined up in, it was July 2007. So straight away from college, no break. And it was at RAF Holton, which is Buckinghamshire. And yeah, I thought it was great. I think in my mind, I just thought it's like a, almost like a holiday camp, but military. Really odd way of putting it. But because I never really had that overall dream of being in the military, I just thought I'd give it a go. It never really sort of dawned on me that, you know, this is what the rest of your life will be like in this military atmosphere. So I remember just enjoying it. I thought I'm quite used to eating my food really fast. So that worked when you were given like two minutes to eat your meals and get back on parade. Um, never ironed before, so that was always new. And um, I made new friends. And I think the hardest part was that I realised you had to run. <laughs> right. And I don't run. You'll never see me running <laughs> unless there's a buffet opened or something. <laughs> but um, that was probably the hardest part. And even though I was joining up as a physical training instructor, you yeah. probably would have thought I should have done more running. But, yeah, no, I didn't. So uh, I definitely found the actual running aspect of the sort of the physical training side of it. You know, I was happy with circuits. It's all indoor and cosy. But, um, yeah, running outside, I'll be out of breath in five minutes. <laughs> now, with uh, basic... Is it called basic training for yeah. the RFN? So yeah, basic training. Do you do weapons and things like that? Of course we do. I mean, you, you, you know, you're normally <laughs> in a hotel, so... Uh... <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's it's quite rare, but we do touch them. <laughs> and, um, but you picked that up okay, considering you don't have a military background? Yeah, I think with because the I had... Um, the coordination built up from when I was younger and swimming, I naturally found shooting quite, I was quite good at it. You know, I had quite a good aim. Okay. And normally if someone tells me to do something, I'm pretty good. I just do it. I don't really question it. And I just thought, oh, you know, I've fired a big gun today. And I'd call <laughs> my mum up and say, oh, I've shot her with a gun, you know, <laughs> not knowing any of the terminology. But, um, but yeah, I think I thought at the time I was pretty badass. I was thought, yeah, let, let's do this, Good. you know. And how long is basic? Can you remember that for the RAF? I think it was nine weeks. Nine weeks, okay. Where I know nowadays they do like a is it two-week taster or one-week taster or something to make sure you um, like get your boots squared. What is it when you... Um, you like have an to, induction type thing? Yeah, or? almost like an induction now. Okay. They have to do like their fitness test early to make sure they are suitable yeah. Where when I joined, we had to do a mile and a half on a treadmill. Oh, right. <laughs> and with treadmills, you can pretty much, I didn't cheat, but you can. And you can <laughs> you talk, know others that may you have can done. You <laughs> can bounce it, you know, and make it go fast and hold yourself up type thing. Yeah. But, um, but yeah, nowadays, I, I'm sure it's still nine, but there's like a little extra induction. They make sure you are ready for it and, uh, you know, That's you get cool. your kit early to make sure it fits or something like that. Yeah, yeah. 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 And then uh, you wanted to be a PTI. So whilst in basic, is it that is that when they're preparing you for your trade, I guess? Yes. So um, after basic training, you then have your graduation and go straight to whatever station it is, whatever base it is to do your trade training. Oh, okay. So it's not at the same place. So it's like phase two, what we'd call yeah. it in the military or it, in the army, sorry. It is phase two. <laughs> but yeah, trade training, I think, was trade the training. lingo. Okay. And so I went to, um, it's now called RAF Cosford, uh, over West Midlands, that way. And, um, and that's where I started my physical training instructor training, which that was when it really was difficult. Okay. I realised I'm not fit. <laughs> <laughs> I definitely needed to know how to run. But um, I thought at the end of the day, they're teaching me how to do it. So I just trusted the system and just carried on with it. And it was great, you know, you got, um, you know, more kit, <laughs> more stash. But, um, but no, the hardest part was, um, this might sound silly, but shouting. I'm not very good at shouting, I found out. I squeal. <laughs> and, and, and it was embarrassing. I didn't realise that I, had, I could project my voice very well. And I had to sort of, I remember being in a sports hall with a um, course instructor shouting across this empty hall and you'd do all the, like these different sayings um i think it's like with a jump feet together place and with a jump feet a stride place 
because you have to like jump into positions. And um, yeah, I just remember shouting it over and over and over again, learning that I had to go deeper to go louder. And oh, it's just embarrassing. Very interesting. Well, one that you got taught how to shout or project voice. That's, that's <laughs> quite interesting to hear. I wonder if they do that in the army. Um, but also how you, how you use different terminology to us, because we definitely don't use that terminology in the army. I think it's, uh, <laughs> it's if you ended up getting based in an instructor like a training, oh, how do I put it? Like, um, like phase one or phase two PTI, okay. where you have to actually um, instruct the new recruits, sort of recruits coming yeah. through, and that's what you would use. Where if you were on a base with just um, like the general population of the military, you wouldn't, because okay. it's not an actual formal class. Right. Where in training and um, sort of recruitment side, you would. Okay. So okay. Um, yeah, you don't hear it very often unless you're going back to teach. Uh, basic training. I just remember the army PTI saying, in position ready, exercise begin. And that was it. it What's just... an exercise? <laughs> <laughs> See, different worlds, we different don't. worlds. We don't. But, um, but yeah, no, PTI, it was good. It was, um, I think the course was about eight months, roughly. Oh, wow, okay. So it was quite long. Yeah. Because um, once you've done it, you go straight away into a corporal rank. Because you have to be in that sort of, in, you're teaching, you're instructing, so you sort of skip a few ranks, and um, and yeah, it was, I think I enjoyed it as best as I could, but it was hard. I couldn't run. I was rubbish at shouting, but I enjoyed playing sport, and I think that's when I found out that yeah, I'm I'm a sportsman, not a fitness person. Okay. So I enjoyed sort of the fun side of sport rather than the let's shout at someone and tell them to do a press up. But, um, but yeah, I think I, I sort of grew as a person during that time. I sort of realised actually this is the job I chose and do my best and hopefully I'll pick it up as I go along. And you did, did the full eight months there? I didn't because I like to mix things up. I, um, I did, I was actually on two different courses. So I did the first course and I, I think I was, I wasn't, I was, wasn't so bad, but I was quite bad. They said I needed to sort of repeat a little phase. Okay. And um, it was mainly the, you had to sort of teach so many warm-ups and then teach so many warm-ups with main lesson. I mean, you repeat it for the full warm-up main lesson cool down. And you have to sort of get ticks. And I sort of struggled in that area of actually teaching a class rather than I can show them and tell them what I need to do. But because I've never taught anything and all of the guys that were in my sort of, class at the time they were all like they've been to uni they've got sports science degrees and as me I'm like well I've swam <laughs> <laughs> I did a bit of college I sort of had no sort of experience in it so I found it a bit more tough so I um did five months then I repeated a couple of sections with the next class coming along and then unfortunately I got to the exact same part five months and I became ill and so what I originally it was just tonsillitis you know, okay. absolutely nothing. But um, it didn't leave and it ended up affecting my heart. And it ended up with like a heart infection. And so I lost all like energy, um, motivation to do anything. And that's when they said, oh, well, we need to downgrade you. And you're unfit for actually doing this part of training. You need to sort of recover, have a rest on a training development flight and um, come back at a later stage when you're fit and ready to do it and at the time I thought yeah that's probably best you know I really didn't feel like myself at all and it was during that time where I thought actually maybe PTI is not for me why am I doing this when actually I realized you can do sport and you don't have to be a PTI to do it and that's when it dawned on me that actually let's look at other trades that I might have an interest in and at the time, because I was ill, I spent a lot of time in a med centre. Right. You see where this is going? Yeah, yeah. And I thought, well, actually, why don't I be a medic? <laughs> <laughs> I've been in the med centre, you know, I've been a patient. I've seen what they do. You know, I can take a pulse, I'm sure. There's one somewhere on everyone. And, um, and that was it. I thought, let's, uh, let's try and be a medic. And then I can just do sport as a side part, you know, and still enjoy it. I don't have to shout or not be fully confident in taking a class and shouting when 
And, yeah, that's sort of how it ended up being. So because I was ill, I thought, let's have this different journey and try a different trade. And then what does that look like? Did you get sent to another <laughs> <Yeah>. RAF station? <laughs> uh... I was working my way around a few stations, yeah. <laughs> so uh, I ended up going to Keo Barracks, an army place. Complete shocker. So different. A bit different. <laughs> really different. I learned the word tab. Oh, yeah. And yeah. I was like, what on earth is one of these? You know, it's not a cigarette, is it? And, do, you, um, do you want to explain that for anybody that uh, <laughs> it might I, be listening abroad? I'm sure it stands for something. Um, so tabbing is when you sort of do like a fast walk and you run bits, walk bits with like a heavy bergen, like a rucksack on your back. And it's called tabbing. But I'm sure tab stands for something. Yeah, I don't know. Is it like tactical? Tactical? Oh, no. It's going to annoy me, this. But what I did find out is the Americans call it rucking. Rucking? Yeah, because I had a conversation with somebody and I was like, oh, yeah, when you go on tabs, they're like, what's a tab? So, yeah, hey. that's a bit of information there. So, yeah, Americans, as far as I'm aware, might not be all the services. Rucking. Call it rucking. I don't know, I don't know if I prefer either. I don't, <laughs> as REF, no, probably don't like it. <laughs> but, um, but, yeah, so I went to Keogh Barracks and that's where medical training is. And... Well, I remember going, these are all fresh recruits. I'm like a couple of years older now because I've, you know, been through a different training part and I've done a few bits twice. I've got a little bit more military life experience behind me. And um, and they all look, you know, fresh-faced out of basic training. And I just thought, oh, wow, you know, let's go with the flow, make some new friends and see what medic's all about. And I learned all about ABC. <laughs> And airway breathing circulation. Oh, thank you. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and CPR and all these things that actually never dawned on me, but I didn't even know it was common sense. Like, I had no idea. I just thought, oh, let's try something new. Where all these fresh recruits were coming in, wanting to be a medic, and it was their lifelong dream. Where I almost felt like a fraud saying, yeah, I didn't want to be a medic. It was my second trade. I thought I'd give it a go. But as my mum always said, try it. You can always leave. And yet at this point, I'm like three years into my service, been to multiple stations on a different trade and I haven't left. So I must be enjoying it somewhere. And I sort of trusted that instinct. And yeah. How come you came to an army barracks though? Is that, is that what they do? They, they just ran the medical training. It was just at an army barracks. So okay. it was um, tri-service training. Oh, it was tri-service. Yeah. Ah, got Sorry. It, got it. So PTI, that was single service where medic, it was a mixture between army, navy and air force. Oh, interesting. So that was the first time I learned about their ways of service as well and the different uniforms. Yeah. And when I say number ones, I mean like my best military dress, where for the army it's your number twos. And Navy's different. <laughs> yeah. And, and yeah, yeah, and that just opened me up to all the different services. And I was like, wow, that is really quite interesting. And yeah. We do have number ones if you're in certain... Oh, uh, do you? Like Royal Engineers, we have number ones, but we don't really wear them, only for special occasions. Okay. Typically, it's number twos, number two dress. Yeah, I know, um, I know you're number two. You have that weird jumper, don't you? Uh, Is it a green jumper when you put a belt outside of a jumper? Well, the engineers never did that, not yeah, when I was in. I never really got that. But I know that, uh, <laughs> I think I was on the camp one time with, oh, we had a boxing tournament and we had the green jackets come over. I'm pretty sure they... They wore it like that. Yeah, um, it's different ways of different yeah, things. It's more some of them it's are traditional, uh, I think. So yeah, no, we were literally um, our number ones, our main dress, and then our working dress, which is like our blue um, shirts and trousers or skirts with our lovely handbags and heels that we do get issued. You have handbags. We have issued handbag and oh issued God. high heels. Really. Really. What? Well, okay. Genuine. So you. <laughs> Your working dress, you get different sort of versions and you can mix and match however you like. So for the REF, we have like a long sleeve shirt for the winter or if you're cold. Short sleeve. If you wear long sleeve, you have to wear a tie. Short sleeve, you don't have to. But then the women also get blouses. So it's like a flat collar. Okay. And then you can choose between trousers or skirt. And if you obviously wear a skirt, you have to wear tights. And then depending whether you're wearing sort of skirt or trousers you can wear sort of flat bottomed shoes which 
I think most wear because it's just everyday shoes or you get high heels. And you can choose these <laughs> when yeah. you want to wear them. Yeah, once you're in, once you're obviously fully trained and you're yeah. on a base, yeah, you can wear whichever you fancy. Really, any time of the year. Yeah, you can really. So you can wear summer wear in the winter, winter wear in the summer. So hang on, there's going to be like an RAF station, and you'd have mixed, essentially mixed dress yeah. so wear summer wear in certain. Yeah, parts as long as you uniform. wear the right parts with the right bits, you know. Really. So for me, I wore my summer blouse and trousers with my flat um, shoes all year round. Blimey, okay, because we have like. One one uniform and it's uh, it's the sleeves up Green. or down. <laughs> um, yeah, no, we have um, yeah. So I did blouse, blouse, trousers, and flat shoes. Mm, okay. Heels and handbag isn't really for me. Yeah, wh- wh- where would you use the handbag? Quite a few do. Just an everyday job to put stuff in. <laughs> <laughs> don't you carry like a rucksack or a backpack? Yeah, you get rucksack as well. You do? Yeah. But if you don't have a lot of stuff to take, you can just take a handbag. <laughs> so we get a black um, handbag with a long strap or you can shorten it if you want. Wow. And you okay. can choose between heels or flat shoes. Such a different world. If I had them here, I would show you. <laughs> <laughs> but unfortunately, no. Oh, that's crazy. <laughs> that's crazy. Yeah. Okay. Okay. If it was me, that handbag would be full of food or snacks or something. <laughs> or go-to bag of wine or something. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so you finish your training as a medic. And, I mean, during that training phase, um, how long was that? Did you did you um, do that for? I think it is six months, Yeah. I believe. Okay. And, um, and that was great. You know, you did... Um, you sort of trained all together, all your different services, and um, and then you get to like the last month or two, and that's when you separate into your individual service. Right, right. Because your job is slightly different. So army will be more combat medic, and they'll do more like in the field type treatment. RVF will learn more about paperwork and admin side, and the navy will do more probably more mini surgery type stuff as well. Because when they're on a ship they could be the only medical person there. So they had to learn sort of extra stuff yeah, that yeah. wouldn't necessarily be what the RAF and Army need to know about. So we sort of learned about our single traded medic training yeah, and go from there. So, yeah. Yeah, really interesting. And and then from from there, um, you go to your... Would that technically be your first... Is it station? Yeah, station, yeah, in the station. RAF, it? yeah. Okay. Um, and, and where was that? So I was posted to RAF Waddington, which is near Lincoln. Okay. And great place. I absolutely loved it there. They always say your first um, station or first base is your best one. And it's true. I absolutely loved it. I thought it was great. And how long was you there for in, in total? I was there for about four years in four total. Four years, okay. Yeah. And in that four-year period, uh, what happened? Did you deploy? Did you... Do sports? What, what happened? Where do you want to start? I did probably everything. <laughs> <laughs> so I got in 2010 and um, at the start, I remember obviously you're this nervous person. You technically know a trade and I actually finished training for a trade for the first time, third time lucky. And um, and yeah, I remember having a meeting with my warrant officer and he would straight away say, right, I've got a PowerPoint for you. And I'm like, What's a, why am I seeing a PowerPoint? I mean, I found out later, it's what he does to all of them, just to scare us all. <laughs> and you'll be like, oh, so how are you going to find out about this treatment? And he'll try and, like, put you on a spot. And what he wants you to say is, I don't know, but I'll go and find that information. But tech, but at the time, everyone just goes, oh, I don't know, I don't know. And he's just trying to judge your character. But luckily, I got on with him quite well. So, um, but no, it was a great time. I, um, in those four years, I was introduced to sport. So I remember telling someone that, yes, I like sport, but I don't know if I'll get into it again. You know, I quit. This is not for me. And uh, and they were like, oh, what's your history? And I said, oh, well, I swam. You know, I did a bit, little paddle. You know, I know how to do it. And they just said, oh, well, we have got a swimming club on site and there's a swimming pool on site as well. And I was like... Well, you know, come along, see what I can do. Playing it right down. <laughs> well, I sort of either didn't want to show off or sort of embarrass them of what standard I've reached because I don't know many people that sort of got to where I got to, and um, especially in the military. 
And yeah, I sort of went along and sort of went slowish and then sort of picked up speed quite quickly because you get a bit carried away. And that's when he said, oh, we, we've got an RAF team. You should come and join us for a training session. And I was like, yeah, all right then. What, what do you get? What happens? What freebie? And they tell me all about the free kit. <laughs> so I'm like, sold. Let's go along. And it was tough because I, all I kept doing was comparing to where, what I used to be and what my old times were. Because I knew every time for every race, all my PBs off the top of my head because they were drilled into me. And my dad had like an awesome spreadsheet when I was younger, so I'd get all the stats. And yet I remember doing my first race for the RAF and I thought, that is really slow. But I did put in all my effort. But I just kept comparing myself. But I never told anybody during that time what my swimming history was. Okay. I just told them that I swam for Northampton. This was who my coach was. And that was it, you know, because I just didn't, I don't know, I think I was afraid to accept my achievement, I guess, in a weird way. And just thought for once, don't judge me on what I used to be. Just let me do what I can do now. But that's when I realised I was really unfit, swimming unfit, because you sort of lose it unless you do it nine times a week. You know, it's mm. not quite the same. And, um, and yeah, so during that time I got into swimming, I ended up getting to the inter-services which is the highest level you can go in the service. So you actually compete in for the RAF against the Army, Navy as a group competition and winning medals. And I was like, wow, I still got it. This is great. <laughs> great feeling. Um, more kit. More kit. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and yeah, it was great. And then I got to a phase where I was like, I think the issue is chlorine. As weird as it is, the smell of chlorine reminded me of my past. And I couldn't help but compare myself. And I knew I wasn't as good as I was, but I wanted to be. And I kept saying, but if I did my old timings, I would have won that race. Mm. When actually years have gone past, I haven't trained. I don't have that mindset of, you know, wanting to be an Olympian. Just stop it and have fun. And I sort of forgot to have fun with sport. I put so much pressure on myself to perform because my whole childhood was all about performance and stats and winning. And, yeah, it's at the time I thought, mm. and that's when I decided to uh, stop swimming again. Okay. But then I was introduced to another sport. <laughs> okay, what was that? By one of the doctors that I worked with, because she kept turning up to work with bruises. And I was a little worried. I was like, you know, he'd been beaten up. And she um, introduced me to rugby. Okay. So she's like, you know, you've got shoulders of a swimmer. You'd be great for tackling. And little did I know, I've um, always been a fan of uh, Leicester Tigers because my dad's from Leicester and I've always followed that rugby team. But I never thought that I could play it. It just never occurred to me. But no, turns out I love it and I love tackling. <laughs> and if I go for it, it's most likely going to hurt them more than it's going to hurt me. <laughs> and so... I thought, this is great. I've got this whole new lease of life. I can't compare myself. I have nothing to go against. And I've got more kit. <laughs> and so I thought, let's give rugby a go. And this is all while I was at Waddington and I played for the local team, Lincoln Ladies. And, um, yeah, I found out I absolutely loved it. And I've got this sort of body shape to be a really good prop. So um, anyone that doesn't know rugby, it's basically the front of the scrum that um, you put your head between theirs. You sort of fight for the ball and leave with your legs. And so I was the uh, front left person, which is a loose head prop. And, yeah, it turns out there's an RVF team. <laughs> so um, my coach for Lincoln Ladies was actually the sort of the staff member at my local AFCO which is the careers office where I joined up he was my sort of person that did all my forms and put me through and he was now my rugby coach and <laughs> I didn't realize it was the same guy but he recognized me straight away yeah and it just really is a small world and he's like oh you know it's an RAF team he was RAF didn't know this I just turned up training one day with his doctor that I've worked with and he said yeah it's an RAF team why don't you go along to um, Cranwell, another base, and there's like a training weekend. Just see if you like it. So I went to Cranwell, 
I thought, oh, this is nice. You know, nice little station here. And um, tried rugby, tried tackling, learned how to pass a ball, found out my coordination is still just as good because I've had it built into me. And uh, yeah, I got onto the RAF team just from that training weekend. And then my second match for the RAF was the inter-services against the Navy. <laughs> really? And I was like, this is big. Like, this is actually quite... I didn't realise at the time how big inter-service rugby was, apart from the Army-Navy at Twickenham every year. Yeah. But this was the RVF Navy and then the RVF Army. And my second and third match as a prop, which is can be quite dangerous if you don't know what you're doing. I didn't. I just thought I'd do my best shot and I can walk away if I don't like it. <laughs> and yeah, I straight away got into inter-services as a prop. And next minute, I'm doing rugby for three years, going on tour to South Africa. Really? And yeah, absolutely loving it. So that... That big game, how how did it go? Can you remember? Yeah, we lost. You lost? <laughs> but did you do okay? You know, yeah. Such a big I think game. I thought, oh, my neck's a bit aching. Because I've never really t- sort of used those muscles before. It's really odd. But until you realise there's like a big after party and, you know, it's it's actually quite a big event. It was just the adrenaline. I just absolutely loved it. That's good. And, um, yeah, that was my new sort of passion in life, my new sport. And I could just... And this was all during my first posting. You know, I was still a baby in the military. I've only been for in for like four years at a time and only just learning my job properly. And yet I'm doing a having a great time with sports at the time. Yeah. So um yeah, crazy. And then you went and toured Yeah, so I went to yeah, did a mil- uh, rugby tour to South Africa. What is that the RAF team? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So um I, yeah, I don't remember much. There was, might have been a few uh, beverages involved. Oh, of course, yeah. And um, <laughs> But we did play rugby games because it has to be an official tour, so you've got to play a game. And lucky for us, one of the team had their own vineyard. So uh, Who were you playing against then? It was like local uni. and one of the, It was a team in Pretoria near Cape Town, I believe, and then another one somewhere else. I really don't remember, but I think one of them was like a local university and another one was maybe another school, another female regional team or something. Okay. And um, and they were really good. We won both of them, um, but it was a great sort of atmosphere and I've never been there before, so it was great to sort of travel somewhere new and sort of represent your service and your country. Yeah. You know, it was a great time. And no doubt you learned stuff from that, you know, traveling, uh, working with the yeah. team. I've never flown on my own before. Mm. You know, I've always, prior to that, it was just holidays with my parents and my family. So I was like, oh, let's just follow the person in front and hope I get on the right plane. <laughs> and um, But as REF, you know, there's hotels involved and we get used to it very quickly. Yeah, late flights. Uh... It's, um, <laughs> very nice, yeah, all on time. <laughs> but no, it was a great tour, great tour, yeah. So what... What does the rest of that four-year first station look like? Uh, is it is it just rugby, or did you go? Did you have to go and do exercises like we do in the army? I don't know. Not really. Not really. <laughs> okay. I remember. Um, well, we didn't realise it was an exercise at the time. Bear with me. <laughs> <laughs> so, me and another medic get told, "Oh, let's. Um, we need two medics just to um, do a little practice training session." And we got all the fake medic gear and we were like, oh, yeah, we'll pretend to patch you up just so they could do whatever skill they were doing. And then little did we know, we're getting on a coach. And we're like, why are we getting on a coach? We're supposed to be just there as a practice medic for a practice session with these other guys. And, yeah, we found out it was a real-life exercise. But we went on a coach with practice medical kit that you couldn't use. And luckily, nobody got injured or hurt. Because they were outside in a field practicing firing positions or something. And me and some medic were just sat on a coach, you know, just chilling out in case someone needed us. <laughs> but we did not even realise, even of um, the management in the med centre, none of them were told if this was real. But we had to actually take proper gear. We thought it was an on-base practice, you know, get your plastic gear out and pretend, you know. And, yeah, that was a shock. But no exercises, not really, unless um, we had to 
I think we did like one every every year just before the air show. So Wellington is was also famous for the Wellington Air Show, okay. where they um, get like all the aircraft and all the public come onto station and actually see what the station does and all about the RAF and the careers and everything. And we would always have a practice before that just to uh, check that we can do mass casualty stuff. And um, what, What's that mass casualties for? So it's like um, when you have... A major event. So we practice to say there's an aircraft that's crashed. What do you do? So we have to sort of practice our skills and learn how to respond with like radio talk and triaging. So you sort of separate the patients up to whether they need um, life threatening injuries and they need treatment straight away or whether they're walking wounded and then everyone in between. And so we would always have to practice those sort of scenarios. And Luckily, every time I was on sort of duty medic, so you'd have to do duties as well. So um, because the airfield was active 24 hours a day, there has to be someone on duty at all times to be ready to assist for any flights that are happening or any emergency on the station. And I almost had a sort of a plane crash at the time, but I wouldn't say lucky for me. They crashed outside of the boundary, so it wasn't actually our responsibility. It was the um, emergency services outside the local hospital and local ambulances. But I remember being in that ambulance on the airfield getting told there's an aircraft coming down, but we don't know where the plane is or where they're going to crash. And I was just like, oh, this is happening. We've practised for ages, and yet we've never, touch wood, had a crash. And, yeah... I was just like, what do I do? What do I do? I do know what I need to do, but you second guess everything that you've been taught. And yeah, couldn't even see the aircraft, but I heard on the radio that they actually did a sort of crash landing, safe landing and such, and um, they were all okay. And the emergency services outside the station attended and they were all fine. But I remember that being probably one of the most panicky sort of moments. I was like, I've got to call someone. This is a Saturday on a weekend, I'm the only one here, only medic on station. And I was in that position of ready to sort everything out. And, yeah, crazy at the time. <laughs> and I think, you know, am I up for the job? But, you you know, luckily adrenaline kicks in, you sort of do what your job is. But, yeah, you just never know when an emergency is going to happen, mm. I guess. Well, you mentioned that was one of your favourite stations, being your first, mm. and... From what you've shared so far, you can tell why. Uh, introduced to rugby, you found that extra sport and travelled with it uh, and you did a few things with your actual trade, which is really cool. And then where did you go after that? What's next? So bef- just before I went to my second posting, I then went on tour abroad. So I was on a four-month deployment to the Falkland Islands. Okay. And so that was my first official operation in the military, going away. And it was at a time where the sort of Iraq war had finished and Afghan was sort of on and off, sort of slowly um, sort of coming to an end. And so the only places that we sort of mainly went to as the RAF were sort of Cyprus or the Falklands. And so I um, was just told one day, they said, right, you're going to go to the Falklands. I was like, yeah, exciting. You know, what does this mean? And um, you literally get told by email. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> I remember getting this email from the manager saying, oh, yeah, you're off. And I'm like, oh, when? <laughs> and I remember misreading it. And I saw a date on there and it said, like, in three months' time. And I was like, in three months' time? And it had a list of all these, like, courses that I had to attend before I went away. And I was like, can I do that? In t- can I do this? And they're like, no, you, you know, plonker. You're reading a form wrong. That's the date of when the training will start. Oh, You're right. going in six months' time. Okay. So I was like, oh, you know, I've got time to sort of let it settle in and adjust because I had a lot of courses to get in. So for that deployment, I had to do Aeromed, which is aeromedical evacuation training. So I had to go to Bryce Norton, which is the big REF terminal, where a lot of the military flights fly from, and do aeromed training. So I had to learn how to put 
um, injured patients on an aircraft safely, whether they were stretcher, whether they were seated, what the process was and how to actually um, travel to another country to pick up a patient and what the process is of getting them sorted and bringing them back to the UK if they needed like emergency treatment or an operation or something like that. And so I did all the training and loved it. You get a nice flight out of it. So I went to, ironically, the Falkland Islands, <laughs> which was perfect because it was just before I was due, about two months before. So I took a few of my kit out there and okay. left it with the medic who I was about to take over from, but they were already there. So I made friends with this medic, said, yep, I'm your um, next medic that's coming in in a couple of months' time. Can I leave some stuff in your room? So he's bringing everything down at one go. And, uh, and that's what I did. And... Why, why do they do that flight beforehand? To Just to practice. So really? it's just a practice. A practice it's run. a practice flight. So the Falklands is in the South Atlantic. So it's yeah. a very, very, it's the longest flight I've ever done. I, I flew there in 2005. Oh. I'm, I'm guessing you go the same route because, well, you flew us yeah. out there. So Ascension Islands, right? Yeah, Ascension. It's the stop off. So a little um, prison cage that it they leave you in. Really is, yeah. Do you want to explain that for people that have never been? <laughs> so Ascension <laughs> Islands is like the halfway point to the Falklands. And um, when you land, it's a very small island, quite uh, rocky, and you, the airfield strip is in between two mountains, pretty much. And so it's like hit or miss. You just hope you've got a really good pilot. Because it, <laughs> it just looks like your wings are about to get taken off. But when you land, there's like, um, I think they call it like the prison or the, um, the cage or something like that. And it's basically where they put all the passengers in an area so you can't wander across an airfield and um so they can sort of give the aircraft a once over quick tidy and fill it up back up with fuel again so you get back on that same aircraft to do your second leg of the journey so it's essentially a terminal with nothing in it an outside terminal <laughs> in a, the middle of the, yeah a this... big cage on an island that looks amazing that you just want to get out and go to the sea and yep. dip your feet in yeah in the sun and there's no shade, no cover, one toilet. I think maybe a vending machine, but you had to have the right currency. Yeah, which, which we none didn't of us have. had. No. <laughs> and we we're all really thirsty. We had to wait to get back on the plane to have a drink or anything at the time. I'm sure it's better now. Well, I'd hope so. Yeah. But back then, you were sort of just left to it and you're like, oh, I've got a phone I can't use. I don't know anybody, so you hope to make a friend. No Wi-Fi. I don't smoke, <laughs> so you don't have that smokers sort of group that you always get. And, yeah, you just have to make the best out of a boring situation. And you're there for about an hour and a half, two hours. It feels longer. Definitely feels longer. <laughs> and, um, and yeah, I was like, where's the hotel, <laughs> you know? Where's, where's all the, where do I go? What do I do? And they literally just chauffeur you like your sheep going into a pen. I'm, I'm glad that you, as RAF, get treated the same way. Oh, it's horrendous. <laughs> <laughs> Terrible about how we get treated. But, um, and yeah, I mean, you get onto that second leg of the flight and oh, I can't remember how long the flights well, were. If I remember was... correctly, I might be wrong here, but I remember something is either eight, nine, eight hours first, and then nine hours, or nine hours first and then eight hours. I think the second part is the longest part. So that's the nine hour one. Yeah, so I mean, it's eight and nine on the way down. And, and that's the way Bryce... back. Bryce down to Bryce to Ascension. Ascension. Yeah, it's eight hours. Yeah. And then nine hours. Nine to the Falklands, I believe. I think that's about right. Yeah. There's a lot more sea. I remember on the second part. Yeah. So even looking out the window, you get to a point where you can read, you can watch, you know, programs on the thing on the back of the seat in front of you. And depends how busy it is. Most of the time you tend to have two seats each because of how long it is. So you can stretch out a bit. So I was quite lucky. I was quite spaced out. And even better when I came back, because I was Aeromed, I did my own seat. So I gave myself a bank of four in the middle. Nice, nice. <laughs> so I thought, I'm lying down for this. What was you flying out on? Can you remember? It was an RAF Yeah, I, I think, was it a Voyager? I'm no good with names, by the way. Big grey one. Okay. Aren't they all big and grey? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think it was a Voyager. I should be good, but I'm not. To me, they're still all planes. <laughs> All, all, all I remember is, one, is it a Herc? Because I know what that is. Wasn't two, a Herc. Two, is it grey? Well, they all are. Yeah. Uh, and three, do you fly backwards? <laughs> no. Is and, it... and it doesn't go wacka wacka. <laughs> <laughs> I think it was a Voyager. 
Oh, I definitely got Voyager on the way back. So that was the new big super duper aircraft that was okay. coming out. Okay. Um, but yeah, I really don't remember. I just remember it being a long and comfortable yeah, you flight. Had, you technically had to do that two times. One, this practice route. And yeah. then And then another one to get out there a and few months later. One. But I love the Falklands. I, I saw it as like um, Butlins for the military. Because I don't know whether it was because I was a medic and we get treated really well out there. And I'm not someone who just um, sits in my room and I'm bored. You know, I wanted to get out and about and experience what the local scenery is and I remember that was the first time I was on a helicopter first time I've seen penguins and elephant seals like if you like your nature and you know exploring it was an amazing place yeah I, I, I definitely concur that um, and I found that penguins move faster than you think they can because yeah. they, they out they out walked me a few times you can smell them before you see them <laughs> that's also you true you really can that's also it true was, um, yeah you can do island hopping going to all the little islands and we're very lucky that the Falkland government gave the base the bowling alley and we had cinema yeah yeah and it was yeah I just enjoyed it I thought you know what work hard play hard let's yeah. um good pool there as well I didn't go in it actually no 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 all right, okay. I think it was because it was quite early on a weekend and I liked my lions or I was on duty. Okay, good excuse. So, um, I was on yeah, duty. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was probably just full of kids, to be fair. So, um, but no, it was great. Like Stanley, it it's like yeah. a, you don't get any tarmac in the Falklands. It's all stone. Mm. So what could be 10 miles away takes you an hour to get there. Yeah. Because you either have to watch that there's big uh, ditches either side the, uh, the road or there's loads of signs saying mines, watch out. That's true. I mean, you see the sheep everywhere on minefields. Yeah, yeah. And you're waiting for one of them to explode. But um, no, it's great. Great diner in Stanley. Yeah. I wonder if you remember that one. I, there's one that everybody went to. I can't remember. Um, and it had really good cake. Well, we, when we went to Stanley, because we, we, we had a, a week off or something, uh, we just drank a lot. There was a bar there, went uh, to a lot. Yeah, it was, yeah, it was a couple, yeah, there was a Navy bar. Yeah, we didn't go there. Where a lot of the Navy <laughs> went and it was like all these memorabilia on the walls and everything of all the ships that came in. Yeah. But... Um, and then it was a big um, whale jawbone thing in the middle of Stanley. Oh, yes. Yeah. Um, yeah, something like that. Yeah. And it, I just remember Stanley just, the whole of it seems to be on a slant. Yeah. So. <laughs> it, was, it was such a different world. It really is. Like, isn't it? Yeah. Everyone that lived there must have had a big tank of fuel because there was like one petrol station. It yeah. doesn't matter where you live, there was just one. And yeah, and I can't, like the accent was like a mixture between American, Brazilian, I don't know. Like it had its own strange concoction of accents. Yeah. But, can, but they're all really nice people, aren't they? Oh, lovely. All really, really nice people. Our receptionist in the med centre, um, she actually had to bring in a baby penguin one day because she just found it on her land and it was um, newly born but been left by the mother and yeah. and it was great. We had a baby penguin in the med centre. <laughs> I was like, this is amazing. But, I, I, I uh, think uh, what, what put me off the Falkland Islands was the weather, the fact that you could have four seasons yeah. in a day. And I remember the, the first day we got there and they were showing us around and giving us the briefs that you get given. Uh, it was sunny when we were walking there. <laughs> It then changed to rain, okay? And as we came out, it was sleeting slash hailstoning. And I'm like, what is this? It's ri you hear about <laughs> it, but you don't believe it until you get yeah. there. And it it truly was. You had to pack for all weathers every day. You had to keep a bag um, of what, the opposite of what you were wearing. And, yeah, that was really odd. Like, we would get patients coming in who have been on exercise and they've got, like, potential frostbite. And you look outside and you're like... It's a heat wave. <laughs> How did you get this? Yeah. But it was like no ozone layer or something or really thin. Yeah. So, and then the um, last bit that really, oh, it frustrated me so much. And if my mum's listened to this, she knows because I wrote, <laughs> I wrote home about this so many times. It was the wind. It's just constant yeah. and it didn't stop. And when you tried to get in your truck, it would close the door on your leg. It would... <laughs> it's like burning wind. Yeah. You would have half a dry face and half a sunburnt face. Yeah. It's moisturise I remember asking for moisturiser in my little uh, shoe boxes oh really because <laughs> I never was a big moisturiser until I went there and I was like this is my skin's either going to fall off or scrape off or burn 
it was it was unreal but one experience yeah like I, i'll probably never go there again but absolutely loved my time that i did did and you learn a lot when you were there about your trade yeah so i've never like it was very similar i was still working in a med center but um i probably did more hands-on more treating where in current med centers it's you do treat but for the RF, it's probably not as much as the other services. There's probably more admin involved. and um, But yeah, when I went out there, I treated more patients. And I obviously had to sort out the aeromed side of things. So for any patient that's already... I was like a ground handler, so I wasn't actually doing flights anywhere. I had to sort of receive the patients coming back from being aeromeded out. So and that doesn't have to be military. It could be... Um, Falkland Islanders who have just gone for an appointment in the UK because that's where the specialist care is. Okay. So I would have to meet them at the terminal when they get back and just make sure they're okay and then get them into, make sure they've got transport or family or someone picking them up on the station and obviously make sure they have access to the station because it is still a military site. So, um, and vice versa, like we had an emergency where there was a, it was a mother who just gave birth in Stanley Hospital, but she lost so much blood that she was literally had one hour to live. And we had to get her from Stanley to the med centre, which again on that rubbish road takes forever, make sure that her and her newborn baby were safe. And he, I don't know if it was a boy or girl, but they were in an incubator. We had to get all of that onto a flight over to... I think they went to was it Argentina. There was like a specialist hospital, I believe, in like Argentina or somewhere sort of South America type way. And they basically had an hour to live. And we had to get there from one country to another, stabilise them. And they had their own medical team that went on that flight. And it was one of those where you're like, we don't think they're going to make it. Like, literally bleeding out, the worst situation I've ever seen. And because I've never did any sort of war conflicts before, but to see something like that come through and then go, whoa, I've just got to do whatever I can do to make sure the right aircraft is ready. We've prepped the inside to make sure that they are strapped down on their stretchers and the incubator as well. And they had any assistance to the medical team that they needed. And luckily, we found out they both survived surgery and they were all absolutely fine. But it literally was hit or miss. And that's probably the main instant I had whilst I was out there. Okay. Yeah. Well, but it was good. It had a happy ending. Yeah, and, I was going to say, it's good that that happened. You know, it's one of those where you just think, whoa, this really does happen. You know, you might not see it all the time, but you still need to be there ready and prepped. And, um, but yeah, no, I, overall, I had a great tour. You know, I, I think I grew more as an adult. I, you know, just had a great time. And luckily I had Halloween. I had, it was just before Christmas when I came back and I surprised my mum actually when I returned as well because she didn't, I lied to her and told her my flight was later than what it was. Okay. But she didn't realise I was landing a day before her birthday. And so I had to sort it out with my dad. He had to pretend to go for an office meeting in London, but pick me up at Bry's. And um, yeah, next minute I was at the back door of my parents' house, dad telling my mum, that there's a parcel that she's missed that it's just left here. Can you go and get it? <laughs> Mum's like, no, you get it. That's like, no, it's for you. I'm not getting it. And then there's just uh, me stood outside and then she burst into tears and I said, happy birthday for tomorrow. But um, I've made it for your birthday. And yeah, that was really good. Nice touch. She's like, I spoke to you this morning. I'm like, I know you did. <laughs> I kept saying I've got to go. I meant I've got to go on a flight. <laughs> but she thought I was arriving a week later. That's nice. So That's nice. luckily the flight's all connected up fine and there was no big delay. But um, but yeah, that was good. So I think I was really lucky I had a good tour because I do hear about people that have been to the Falklands and they hated it. They thought it was rubbish and boring and they didn't enjoy it at all. But I found it complete opposite. I loved it. 